What a joy it is for me to be here tonight for a lot of reasons. Uh, I grew up in Memphis in the shadow of this church under the influence of great preachers and great preaching and great ministry. You have a strong tradition. I hope I don't mess it up tonight. But what a joy it is for me to be here. Uh, the first time I've had the opportunity to preach, I've been here many times. And I have to tell you up front that my first chance to do some things has not always worked out so well. It's not always been the greatest thing. Uh, my very first church, everything in that church was brand new to me. I'd never done anything. I'd never done a Lord's Supper, never done a baptism, never done a wedding. Everything was the first thing. I'll never forget my first baptism in that little country church. We didn't have a baptistry in the church. They always used Mr. O.C. Jarrett's pond every year. They waited for spring, and so spring came. We had a few folks. We went out to Mr. O.C. Jarrett's pond, and uh, we kind of held hands and went out. There. I didn't know how to do this, but we just held hands and went out into the water about waist deep, kind of like the crossing of the, when Tarzan would call the elephants. You know, we just kind of all gathered together and walked out there. And they were standing on the bank singing, Shall We Gather at the River? And in the middle of that, we, we had made an agreement that when we got through that song, then we'd have the baptismal service. So my very first service, my very first baptism, and the guy standing next to me was a big old strapping farm corn-fed farm boy, and he was about twice my size, and he was a little nervous during the song, and he turned to me and said, Pastor, I hadn't said anything about this before, but I'm scared to death of water. I said, oh, brother, this ain't the time for that. <laughs> Trust the Lord, brother. Trust the Lord. And so we made it fine. I started down under the water with him, and when I got, got his head under the water, he stuck his feet straight up in the air. And all I could remember was my Bible teacher saying, you got to get total immersion. So I just threw my leg over his, and in the name of Jesus, I just rode him down. I don't know if you're supposed to do that, but we went down together. That was my first baptism. I thought about it when y'all were having baptism tonight. I said, boy, they hadn't seen anything. My first Lord's Supper was in that church as well. One of the deacons came to him and said, Preacher, I know you're worried about what to say. You just worry about what to say and let me take care of the Lord's Supper. And so he had everything ready. So he was right. I was worried about what to say. My dad was a pastor and I called him. I said, Hey, Dad, what do you say at the Lord's Supper? So he explained it to me. I wrote it down. When I was standing in front of the group that night, I, I realized that something kind of smelled like paint. I wasn't sure what it was, but something smelled like straight. I said, Well, it's probably just me. They probably did some painting or something. And so I went on with my spill, and I got to that place where, okay, guys, call the deacons up, and you guys uncover the table, and we're going to have the Lord's Supper. And we made it through the bread just fine, but when we came to the juice, I noticed it was a different color. I thought, well, maybe, you know, grape juice is just different here. Maybe it's a different color. I didn't know that that guy who had volunteered for service had always wanted to use real wine. We were a dry county, so he'd gone to the sheriff, got some confiscated wine, and he had the Lord's Supper ready. I tell you, drinky all of it took on a new meaning that night. <laughs> My wife to this day says the only drink she's ever had is in church during the Lord's Supper. <laughs> so my first time hadn't always worked out. I sure hope this works out a little better tonight. I want to talk to you tonight about a very simple and yet profound subject. I want to talk to you tonight about faith. And I want to talk out of my own struggle tonight and out of the things that God has taught me and God is teaching me. I want to take my text from Hebrews chapter 11. Let's read together in verse 6. The writer of Hebrews says, but without faith it is impossible to please God. Can we just stop right there? Without faith it is impossible to to please God. And here's what that verse tells me. We need faith. If we don't have it, we're not pleasing to God. Faith is indispensable to the Christian life. It is what fuel is to a car. It is what air is to the human body. I mean, without faith, no matter what else we do, if we don't have faith, we can't please God. Faith is so important in our life Faith determines what God can do in your life. Matthew 9, 29, Jesus is walking along. They're 
two guys, two blind men, they come to Jesus. They say, Lord, we know you can heal us. We know you can. We've seen what you do, and we, we know you can heal us. And so Jesus just asked them a simple question. Do you believe I can do it? They said, yes, Lord, we believe you can do it. And here's what Jesus said to them. According to your faith, so be it. You know what Jesus meant? He meant that these guys and their faith was going to determine what God could do in their situation. Their faith was going to set the parameters for God. Now, can I tell you that God can do anything, but He has chosen to work within the parenthesis of faith? And so I, I have to ask you a question tonight about your faith. And right in the beginning of this message, I think you need to do a little personal inventory. Years ago, a man named Manly Beasley, the only conversation I ever had with Brother Manly, he asked me this question. What do you believe in God for today? Did he ask you that question when you talked to him? What do you believe in God for today? And so I ask you that question tonight, Bellevue Baptist Church, Memphis, Tennessee, Oakland Baptist Church, Corinth, Mississippi. What are you believing God for? And how big is your God? Faith determines what God can do in your life. Faith can solve impossible problems. My wife's favorite verse is Matthew 17, 20. Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you can say to your mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and it shall be done. Now listen to this. Nothing shall be impossible to you. You have anything impossible in your life? Got any impossible situations? Did you know that the word impossible is not in God's vocabulary? There is nothing you can dream of, nothing you can make up, no situation that you can come to me with tonight where it is impossible for God to work. Now, there's a lot of them that are beyond us. Doesn't take much, does it? Doesn't take much to get beyond me. But there is no situation, there is no sickness, there is no moment of despair. There is no situation that is overwhelming to you. There is no lifelong baggage in your life, things that you've been trying to shake and things you've been trying to throw off that you have not been able to throw off. You lay them down for a week and then you find yourself going back. While it may seem impossible to you, while it may be impossible to you, there is nothing impossible with God. Listen, Brother Andy, tonight. When you put a small faith in a big God, great things happen. Anything that does not come from faith is sin. Romans 14, 23. Whatever is not of faith is sin. What does that mean? It means that anything that I try to do without trusting God is sin. Did you know there's a right way to do a right thing and there's a wrong way to do a right thing? You know, the Pharisees were big on prayer, but particularly on prayer in public. They wanted to be seen. So praying is a good thing, but when you do it for the wrong reason. Giving is a good thing, but when you give to be seen, when you give to be impressive, when you give to impress people, that's not the motivation that the Word of God has given us for giving. So you could do a good thing, a right thing from the wrong motive. And that's the thing about God. He not only knows what I do, but He knows why I do it. And He knows if I do it, trusting Him to do it. You know, we got so much going on in our life. We we say The Bible says that we're to pray about everything, but yet there are a lot of things in our life we don't take time to pray about. We just do it. And we justify it in our mind by saying, well, look, I I know God's busy. He's running a universe. And so I'll just take care of this. I I have this. I got this. I can do this. That's what the Scripture said, Romans 14. Anything that we do that does not involve our faith is sin. So we've got to trust God for big things, but we've also got to trust God for little things. So how do you know if you trust in God? How do you know? I want to give you a few ways tonight, and I want to define faith as best I can tonight to tell you in in my lingo, in my vocabulary, what I believe faith is. Number one, faith is stretching your imagination. 
Genesis chapter 15, God calls Abram outside, the Bible said. I like the way the scripture puts it. He called Abram outside. And when he got Abram outside, he said to Abram, Abram, look up at the stars. And Abram looked up at the stars, kind of like these lights that are in the sanctuary tonight. And when he looked at them, he said, Abram, I'm going to tell you something. Your children and your descendants are going to be more than the stars that are in the sky. You ever looked at the stars and tried to count them? You ever been camping out as a kid? You pick out the big and little dipper, and after that it gets kind of challenging. But you pick, you pick those two things out, and then you, then you decide you're just going to count the stars. Can I tell you that counting stars is kind of like counting minnows in a bucket. You just can't do it. They just all run together after a while. And when you get up to the, to the when you get up to 100, you just can't figure out, did I start here, did I stop there? Because there are just too many. It was more than Abram could take in with his math, and it was more than Abram could take in with his mind. It stretched his imagination to believe God. Included in your prayer tonight was what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, in his description of God. And here's what Paul said about God. Unto him who is able, to do all that we ask or think above all that we ask or think abundantly above all that we ask or think exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think now I want to show you something about that verse that verse is dealing with your imagination and with my imagination And out there in that realm of our imagination, past what we think we can do or can be done, out there in that realm of our imagination, that's where God works best. That's where God shows himself best. But we limit God because we're thinking back here on the trunk of the tree. God's trying to get us to think out there on the limbs. Sometimes I think we think too small for God. We try to give God something that we feel like is within His reach and maybe within ours. If He can't do it, we'll back Him up. And Paul said, unto Him who is able to do more than you can imagine. Just think about church. Think about the ministry of the church. Think about... What God's going to do with you and for you and through you in your life. You ask people, how how are they doing? What what are you doing? Oh, I'm just trying to get by. You hear that a hundred times a week, don't you? Oh, I'm just trying to get by. Listen, God didn't intend for you to just get by. God has bigger plans for you. Bigger than you can dream. Bigger than we can imagine. Stretch your imagination. If you want to see God work in your life, stretch your imagination. Out there where you, you, beyond your dreams, that's where God wants to work in your life. Faith is stretching your imagination. Secondly, faith is taking the initiative. Mark chapter 5, Jesus gives us a story of a woman who has an issue of blood. It's a great story. She has a problem with bleeding and She's tried a lot of stuff. You know, that story is mentioned in three Gospels. One of them is Luke. It's interesting, the other two Gospels say about this woman, she spent all she had on doctors, but Luke doesn't mention that phrase. <laughs> Just brings a smile to my face every time I read Luke's version. He, the, Luke, the physician, leads off that phrase about she spent all she had on doctors. He didn't feel led to put that in there. But the other gospel writers do this woman was desperate she'd been a lot of places done a lot of things she had this problem that was an albatross around her neck every day of her life the first thing in the morning she thought about it the last thing at night she considered it and during the night she had to deal with it she could not stop her bleeding she hears about Jesus she does not wait on Jesus to come to her 
She hears that Jesus is passing by, he and his entourage, he and his followers, he and those that are seeking a miracle in their life. Jesus is passing by. So she positions herself. She positions herself perhaps on a street corner that she knows the parade, the Jesus parade is going to pass this way. As the parade gets closer, the crowd gets more intense and she's pushed back. She's weak. And at the last minute, she just reaches out the best that she can and she touches the hem of his garment. And Jesus stopped the parade. He says to his disciples, somebody touch me. Can you see the disciples? Lord, what do you mean? of course somebody touched you. Look at the crowd. These people are going nuts over you. What do you mean somebody touched me? But what it was, this woman had touched him with a touch of faith. The touch of faith always stops Jesus' parade. And no matter how many other people are here tonight, no matter how many other people come and maybe at the simultaneous moment come and ask God to meet their need, can I tell you that every touch of faith stops Jesus' parade? And even in a crowd, he understands when there is one person who is reaching out to him. The Bible said in Mark chapter 5 that this woman did not wait for Jesus to come, but she took the initiative. That's what faith does. Faith acts. A lot of our people are here tonight. A lot of our people came. A lot of our people are in the choir. I want to tell you, I'm so proud of you and Brother Jim, just such a and Carol, such a blessing to me tonight. And thank you, Oakland folks that came to support this service tonight and worship. What an encouragement you are to me. If I were to open up my heart and tell you completely my vision for our church, it would scare some of my people that are here tonight that probably scare them to death. Honestly. Honestly. We got a lot of things coming in our church. You know, there are some things that come into a pastor's mind and heart and they don't stay but a day or two and they pass on through and, and I don't pay much attention to them. But there are some things, Dr. Steve, there are some things that God puts in a pastor's gut and he just doesn't let him sleep and he just, he, you can't get over it and you don't get past it and you know you just got to deal with it. And we're in the midst of that right now. There are some things that I'm fixing to lay on a church that God has laid on my heart, a vision for where we are. We just, in the last year or two, we just paid off a building and, and so we really, we, we relocated and we paid off a building and now we're going to we're ready to use that money in ministry and God's turning us loose and freeing us up to do some things and I have to tell you that my heart and my vision is about more reaching more people than just are in the inside of our church I believe there's something that has to happen in the life of believers to get the church outside of the building so that they can do ministry it was the Pharisees who always tried to keep Jesus in the church and keep him in the building if you will and it was them that Jesus irritated because he always found himself sitting on the side of a well in the heat of a day waiting on a woman who'd had a disastrous life and he said I need to talk to this woman there's some ministry that needs to happen outside the church we got to get outside the building that's where God's leading me that's what God's impressing me on my heart so the church hadn't voted on it yet The church don't know about it yet. But here's what's happening. We're already taking care of some housekeeping things and getting some approval for this and some approval for that and those kind of things, that legal kind of things that have to be done so that we can do that ministry, so that when I do present that and lay that on the church, I'm taking the initiative on some things. Now, I know God can do anything. He could send all this approval. He could take all these. He could send it all in a dream and all in the middle of the night. But you see, there are some things that I need to do. When Jesus turned the water into wine, he explained to them, go get some barrels and fill them up with water. Isn't that the, doesn't that seem ridiculous to you? (laughs) Jesus didn't have to have water. He could have just created the wine. He could have just made it happen. But he let people do what people could do. And then when they came to the end of what they could do, 
God began his work. Can I tell you something, Bellevue Baptist Church? God still wants to turn water into wine. God still wants to make lives richer and more meaningful and ministry more powerful. And it's the difference that, but, but we've got to be willing to do some things. We've got to be willing to take the initiative. Like this woman in Mark chapter 5. Faith stretches your imagination. Faith takes the initiative. Thirdly, faith is risking a failure. There is no faith apart from risk. I grew up in Memphis, my people. My roots are in Texas. I was born in Houston. I have a lot of people who are from Texas. And so every summer we would make the trek as a boy, we would make the trek from Memphis to Houston. Halfway is Texarkana. And the reason I know that is because halfway was where we spent the night in a motel, and I always begged, I don't care what kind of place we stay in, just so it's got a swimming pool. That's a big deal. I didn't have a swimming pool. They'd wake me up and say, we're almost to the motel. And I'd say, Mom, we got a swimming pool? Yes, son, we got a swimming pool. We knew you'd want a swimming pool. So I'd get in the swimming pool. I'd be in that shallow part, you know, and I'd be have my feet on the ground. I'd be kind of crouched down. I'd be, hey, Mama, you see me swimming? Yeah, son. We say, you're swimming. Yeah, I'm just, just cutting up. One day I got to that part in the pool. You know where it goes down like that? <laughs> and I was telling my mama to watch me. Hey, mama, you see me swimming? And then I hit that part. <laughs> you see, I was swimming as long as my feet were on the bottom. That's the way we are about some of our faith. As long as we're in control of the situation. As we... As long as we control the income and the outflow and the, everything about the situation. But sometimes God puts us in a situation where our feet are not on the bottom. And that's where real faith begins. That's where faith begins. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to go with a group of preachers to, to Seoul, Korea to preach. And here's what the guy told us in orientation. He said, you know, some of you preachers that are going... God's going to paint you in a corner while you're here, and you're going to have to trust God. You've never had to trust God like this, but you're fixing to have to trust God. And he was right. God put us in some situations. You know, to give your heart to Christ, and perhaps there are some friends here tonight who are wrestling with that decision. You're pondering giving your heart to Christ. You know, it's amazing that a that a 10-year-old boy can give his heart to Christ and a 40-year-old chemist wrestles with it because he's not sure of everything. You know the difference in those two men? This 10-year-old boy simply trusts God. But the 40-year-old chemist has to figure it out. Now, wait a minute now. Let's, let's, let's analyze this. Let's put it in a test tube. Now, now I've got I to gotta diagram this sentence. I, I've, I've got to cut this thing. I've got to dissect this thought. I mean, I've got to put this thing. I've got to figure everything out about this. When I was a boy, my mom had a bunch of brothers and sisters. And every year we'd gather in Texas for the family time together, a reunion, and I had a bunch of cousins growing up. My grandparents lived in a house that on one end of the front, had a long front porch on it, and on one end it was level to the ground, you know what I'm saying? And the other end was like kind of like this right here. There was, there was a little drop off because the ground wasn't level, but the house was. So every summer as a kid, here's what I remember us doing. We would get on this end of the porch that was close to the ground, and we'd run the length of that porch. And when we got to the end, other end of that porch, our daddy would be there to catch us, and we'd just, jump, we'd just leave that porch and jump, and our dad would be there to catch us. It never crossed my mind that when I left that porch and hit midair that my dad would back away and let me hit the ground. I'd, I'd never even considered, never crossed. You know why? Because I trusted him. And that's what faith is. Trusting God. And there comes a moment when you're coming to the Lord. For, for those of you that are here tonight that have come to the Lord, there was a moment in that experience where you had to trust God. You knew He would save you. You knew what the Bible said, that you were a sinner and you needed to trust Christ. You knew that. But there still comes that moment where you have to trust Him to do it. Where you have to faith Him to do it. Years ago, I was listening to a sermon by Dr. Rogers, and he said sometimes in our conversation, we ask people how they're doing, and as believers, we ought to be asking ourselves, how are you faithing? How is your life going? How are you trusting God with your life? 
you know what they, you need to do to be saved. Maybe someone is here tonight like that, and you have a head knowledge of what salvation is. But the thing is, you have to come to that moment where even though you know everything, you have to trust Him to save you. Maybe that moment will happen in your life tonight. Maybe tonight will be the night where you trust Him to save you. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. If you're not willing to take a risk, you'll never become a Christ follower. You'll never come to Christ. You'll never walk with Christ. Someone said, remember the turtle. He only makes progress when he sticks his neck out. It takes faith to visualize what God can do. And it takes the risk to accomplish it. Now here's the deal. I don't know about Methodists. I don't know about Presbyterians. I don't know about Pentecostals. I know about Baptists. Let me tell you about Baptists. Baptists are not big risk takers. You know? I mean, if they can't see the end of it, I don't know, Brother Andy. We never done this before. Nobody else is doing this. I've never seen this work before. I've never seen this before. Do you remember Simon Peter, the disciples in the boat, and they see Jesus walking on the water? John, the man of faith, recognizes it's Jesus. John said, that's Jesus. Peter, always the man of action, putting his foot in his mouth every other day of his life. Simon Peter looks at Jesus and says, Lord, bid me to come to you. You say, preacher, you don't have to tell me the rest of that story. I know what happened. He got out of that boat. He took a couple steps on that water. He went right down to the bottom, and you're right. But at least he got out of the boat. It's safer in the boat, isn't it? Can I tell you, that group of the disciples that stayed in that boat, that didn't take a risk and get out on that water, they didn't sink, but also they didn't know what it was like to walk on water. And I'm going to tell you about old Peter. He took a couple steps on that water. I'm going to tell you about me. I'm 61 years old. I'm tired of the boat life. I am tired of the boat life. I want to be out there where if God doesn't come through, I don't make it. I want to see God work. I want to see God work in my church. I want to see God work in my town. I want to see God work in my state. I want to see God work in my nation. In, in a few weeks, we're going to have this election. Listen, I don't care, and I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't care what's happening. This nation is not going to be turned around by a political anything. It's a spiritual problem in this country, my friend. We're going to have to see that. It's too big for politics. One election, ten elections is not going to turn this around. Until God's people get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Faith is number four waiting on the answer. Listen to Psalm 40 verse 1. David said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and he heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit. Anybody here ever been in a pit? I'm going to tell you what's interesting about this verse. I had to read it a bunch. Before, yeah, I'm, I'm slow like that. But I had to read it a bunch before I realized one of the things this verse was saying. David is saying, I was in the pit and I waited patiently for God while I was in the pit. I could see him waiting patiently if he's on the mountain. I could see if he's on one of the Hawaiian islands, he would be patiently waiting. He's in the pit. And he's waiting for God. Some of you that are here tonight are, are in a pit. Some of, some of you in a pit of your own making. Some of you as a result of what someone else has done unfairly in your life. Some situation you didn't have control of. Maybe it was your parents or maybe it was your husband or your wife. Or some event, maybe it's someone you worked for, some boss in your life. But at any rate, something has happened in your life and, and you just can't seem to get out of the, the, the rut. 
pit. You can't seem to get out of the pit. Here's what David's saying. He brought me up out of the pit. He brought me up. Now, I want you to listen, Brother Randy, tonight. Every once in a while as a believer, it would do you good to go back to when you met the Lord and to look over into that pit where you were when He found you. Some of us have been saved so long. We've been in the church. All our friends are Christians. All our friends are believers. Everybody that we know or we're kind of with, we're, we're, not, we're, we're, we're insulated from the world. We're isolated. We're not just separated. We're isolated. We're not even coming in contact, in conversation with people who are unbelievers. That's what irritated the Pharisees about Jesus. They accused him in a derogatory way. He's a friend of sinners. Oh, don't tell me that. That's compromise, isn't it? I mean, to be a friend with somebody that's a sinner? Faith is waiting for the answer. Only God can bring you out of the pit. Here's the last thing. Faith is rebounding from failure. And maybe this right here is what I've come to say tonight. Maybe this is why God wants me here. Isaiah 43, verse 18. Do not remember the former things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? Listen to this. I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God says wherever there was failure, there's going to be success. Wherever there was frustration, there's going to be satisfaction. Wherever there was great dryness, there will be a flood of water. It will be so great that you won't even remember like it was before. Dr. Steve's already made mention (coughs) of my family that's here tonight. All my grandchildren are here but one. We come to Memphis often. I have eight grandchildren. I have three grandchildren that are St. Jude patients. Some of my friends from St. Jude are here tonight. Some of their friends, I understand. Three of my grandchildren have a blood disorder called PK deficiency. And what it is basically is that their red blood cells are in odd shape. They're healthy, but they're in odd shape. And when their red blood cells come through their spleen, their spleen does not recognize the odd shape, and they make themselves anemic. St. Jude's a wonderful place. has thousands of patients. Only a very small number of patients have this condition, and we're still learning about it. The only thing they know to do is when that child's, particular child's spleen gets so enlarged that they can't stand it anymore, they just take their spleen out. So my oldest grandchild has had her spleen removed. When her little brother came along and had that condition, he got to the age, and, but they've been watching, taking pictures. Wonderful place, St. Jude. Wonderful place. God uses St. Jude to meet a lot of people's physical and emotional needs and it did ours came time for him to have surgery he was a little older than her he was five years old and so they prepared us and it's we'd been through it before once and so we understood about the splenectomy taking the spleen out several hours surgery so we're there and I prayed that morning I said God just bring him through this surgery so I'll ask you, Lord, just bring him through the surgery. So we were prepared to wait for a while. After just a few minutes, about 30 minutes, the team of doctors, surgeons, St. Jude, they came out. It's always a scary thing, isn't it? It's always scary. They, they come out too early. They call my daughter and her husband out in the hall. They have a conversation with them. They're scratching their heads. I said, we've been taking pictures of this little boy and his spleen. We've been watching it for a while. We took a picture as early as last week. When we get in there to remove his spleen, there's another spleen in there. They said it's small and it's functioning. And we think it's a miracle.
And they said, we want to leave it. We want to take the bad one out. We want to leave the other. Hayden was, they call it an accessory spleen. Hayden was five years old. Stand up, Hayden. Stand up. Hayden's 10 years old. I think it was a miracle. And here's what I want to show you. Here's what I want to show you about God. He says in Isaiah, he makes streams in the desert. He makes roads in the wilderness. In other words, God makes roads where there is no road. God makes a way when there is no way. God makes a way when the medical profession says there is no way. God makes a way when the psychologist says there is no way. God makes a way when the world says there is no way. The devil says there is no way. Jesus said, I am the way. When there is no way, He makes a way. See, that's my word for you tonight, and that's what you, I want you to understand about faith. God will make a way. In your situation, God will make a way. Brother Randy, I, just talk, I, don't, see how, I don't see how I'm going to get out of this. I don't see how I'm going to get past this. I don't see how I'm going to get over this. I don't see how I'm going to overcome this. I don't see how things could ever be better. Don't factor God out of the equation. God can make a way. He can make a stream in the desert. He can make a road in the wilderness. He can make a hole in the hedge. God can make a way. He is the way. You got to believe that tonight. You got to hold on. You got to latch on to that tonight. He is the way. And if in your faith you could latch on to God that way, you would see God do in your life what you're not able to do. In this day and age full of chaos, there seems to be a meltdown going on in our country. Sometimes it's a little overwhelming to us. And in the midst of all of this that's going on, we have a choice to make tonight as believers. Are we going to believe God? Are we going to trust God? Are we going to faith God? Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches over us all. Have faith in God. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Listen to me, Bellevue Baptist Church. Have faith in God. Listen to me, desperate Sister, desperate brother here tonight, desperate to see God do something in your life, have faith in God. If your faith could touch God, if your faith could grab a hold of God tonight, you would see God do in your situation what only God can do. Last thing, there's nothing impossible with God. It's not in his vocabulary. He doesn't know the word. He doesn't know the concept. If he needs the waters to part, he'll part the waters. If he needs the sun to stop, he'll stop the sun. If he needs the the blood to stop, he'll stop the blood flow. If he needs the blood to start, he'll start the blood flow. If he needs the spleen to come out, he can replace it if if he so desires to. God can be God. Let God be God in your situation. I don't know what your situation is, but it really doesn't matter. Let God be God. Have faith in God. Let's bow our heads as we pray. We got more than one situation here tonight. We got a we got a room full of situations. God only works in people's lives who are desperate for God to work. Maybe that's where you are, like the woman with the issue of blood. You're at the end of it. You've tried and tried and turned it over and turned it over and you You've started over and started over, but to this point, you've not let God be part of your formula of your life. I'm challenging you here tonight. If you're here tonight and you're an unbeliever, begin your walk with God tonight by trusting God. How do I know He'll save me? Brother Randy, how do I know that He'll? Because He said He would. You've got to trust Him to do it. You've got to commit yourself to Him. Maybe you're here, there, and yonder. You don't really have a church home. You're all over the place. You're at a different church every week. 
There's no accountability in your life. You're not growing. You're just, you're just enjoying the, the, the sermon and the service in a million different places. And maybe God's telling you you need to plant your life. And maybe you need to plant your life in this church. Be accountable to other believers. God wants to grow your family and you want to plug in here. Maybe you're saved, but there's nothing fresh God is doing in your life. Maybe you just need to say, Lord, you know what I need to do? I need to commit my life to you, and I, I want you to do something fresh in my life. I need a touch. I need a touch. Father, I pray that you'll take this stuttering, stammering, feeble effort on my part. And, Lord, that you'll take the words and the truth of what I'm trying to say and you'll strike a chord in someone's heart like this brother striking on this guitar. You'll strike a chord of harmony and you'll begin like a magnet or even right now. You'll draw folks to you. Maybe there's someone here tonight who needs to trust you. Someone here tonight who needs to faith you, needs to believe you, needs to begin their walk of faith. Maybe they need to come to one of these pastors tonight and say, I need to trust God for something. I need to trust Him for salvation. I need to trust Him for healing. I need to trust Him for the disaster that's in my life right now, for the outcome. I'm in the pit, and I need, I, need to, I need to patiently wait on God to bring me up out of this pit. But I'm believing God to do it. In Jesus' name, would you bring glory to your name tonight? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.